Right afternoon, folks, down here in the Think Tech Studios, uh, the basement of the Pioneer Plaza building in Honolulu. Uh, Ted Ralston here, your host on Where the Road Leads. Uh, episode today, as has many episodes in the past, deals with UAVs. Uh, this episode is uh, Where the Road Leads to a UAV near you. In fact, maybe even business in Hawaii coming from that. As you'll notice, there's nobody here at this uh, desk here. In fact, I'm actually Captain Kirk uh, of the Enterprise sitting in for Ted Ralston today. But the reason the folks aren't here physically in the, um, in the studio is that they're taking a snow day. It's uh, been snowing very heavily outside uh, today and they couldn't make it down here in Honolulu. But we do have John Mullen, one of our frequent flyers on in California, uh, bringing up to us again a very important subject, cyber, and cyber as how it relates to UAVs. The two are really both components in the same system. So that'll keep it from becoming a monologue. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to also uh, let you know, those who are faithful followers here, that uh, uh, our studio operator, manager, CEO, uh, Jay Fidel, has all given us a great, great raise. We are moving from the basement of this building to the eighth floor of this building uh, next week. So we'll see you in a I'd, similar setting, I presume, in terms of the camera proje projection, but uh, a completely different facility. So this is the very last show emanating from this particular place in the basement of Pioneer Plaza, eighth floor next time. So uh, just an uh, administrative note for you all to enjoy. In any case, um, normally we would be having a bantering conversation back and forth here, and uh, uh, as you can see, that won't be the case, but we have John uh, on to help us uh, keep that active and live. But, you know, there's, we, my involvement here began with Jay's interest in UAVs and uh, connected into UAVs and such here in, in Hawaii. And it's, the whole subject is moving so fast and in so many dimensions that we could never have imagined. Uh, those of us who've been dealing with the aerospace system and for years or with the FAA and such, there's, the changes are happening every day, including one that happened yesterday that affects us here in Hawaii. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's, uh, it's almost impossible to keep track of what's going on. And so I think what we'll do is just keep bringing up these changes as they occur to our, our public and uh, uh, see if we can all sort of ride this horse together here. It's, uh, the future is certainly um, the future of UAVs and other robotics as well. Uh, and uh, so many different aspects of uh, society are affected by that. There's one I wanted to bring up to all of our attention, and we'll hit, all, hit it during all three segments on this show. In, in addition to the economic issues and the technical issues and the regulatory issues, there's the issue of respect. We bring something new into the game, like a UAV or a drone or whatever you want to call it, uh, it adds and provides a new capability in the hands of people that may improperly use it. So respect, and, and respect for people's desires, respect for privacy and such, or something that is... Uh, a behavior factor that uh, can be legislated, but it's very hard to enforce and police. So we're going to have to all work together on that. And in particular, we have an opportunity this Monday to show our proper respects at the lantern floating ceremony down at Ala Moana Park. 50,000 people will be assembled. And in some respects, you might think of this as uh, uh, a, a uh, recollection of uh, funeral activities. And since there could be as many as 4,000 strong, so this is a a significant uh, ceremonial event and it's really inappropriate to have uh, drones show up there. So if you've got a drone and you're thinking of coming to the floating lantern ceremony on Monday, why don't you go to a park or something and get your flying uh, uh, craving done during the day and then show up at the Alamona Park for the ceremony itself but leave the drone at home. That would be a great indication of respect and uh, mature behavior here. So anyway, that's the beginning of the, of the monologue. Uh, John, uh, let me turn to you in the conversation you and I had earlier today about the e emerging concepts of, you might call it modular construction in the, uh, in the software industry, and how that has a f an effect on drones and UAVs, which are basically components of the electronics industry as well, and modular construction, modular design and development is essential to the economic success, but it also provides an avenue towards what we always speak of on this show, and that's the reliability and the, the safety and the certification that is going to be essential in the world of UAVs. Say a few words, John, about this emerging 
uh, concept of modularization in electronics? Well, it, I think it's emerging, but it, it also has its roots in uh, solid engineering, systems engineering, where if you're going to put something together and uh, you build one of them, it can be your craftsman. If you build uh, a number of them on an assembly line, you use some sort of process model. Uh, they usually call it something like zero defects. Uh, there was a gentleman named Toyota, T-O-Y-O-D-A, who basically brought it forward in Japan, the Henry Ford of Japan, and it's a process by which you uh, standardize uh, interfaces and standardize tooling so that uh, as you make more than one of these, they're, they're the same or they're, they're uh, equivalent. And then uh, also the process of engineering testing, where you are sure that the behavior that you expect is what actually occurs. Uh, the definition of quality, which is uh, the uh, deviance from specification, observed behavior as it deviates from specified behavior, uh, as that goes closer and closer to zero, you have a high quality rating. So all of those are engineering process ideas that are used to make sure you have a quality product, make sure your safety is replicable. You can, uh, when you test something and you make 100 of them, you make, and you test the 101 unit, it'll test the same way as the, the first unit. Uh, and then also that uh, certification and uh, regulation can be incorporated. So I think these are, um, they're used in any kind of mass manufacture of, of electronic equipment, but uh, drones is very important because a drone can fall out of the sky and hit somebody on the head. I mean, it's more than just a little uh, toy that somebody uses. It's, it, it can be a, more and more they're part of society. We've got these privacy issues. There are people, Ted, that, uh, that believe that uh, it's their right to take pictures of humans because it's, especially if it's a uh, celebrity, because the celebrity has given up their rights to privacy in some cases because of their celebrity status. So it's all these legal determinations. So it, it's not a black and white area, obviously. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's something we have to work with in our society. But I really applaud your concept to respect and self-respect. That's what governs our behavior here and uh, try to keep that up. Uh, but going back to the discussion we were having on the uh, uh, partitioning of systems and the standardization that can occur by virtue of that, uh, which the aircraft industry has been, that's what it was raised on. That's what made the aircraft industry and air transport and the airlines successful is that whole type design concept. And what I was intrigued by is some of the things you're saying are the beginning of that type design concept starting to apply in the world of complex electronics and cyber systems. And we've got to find a way to vector that into the world of UAVs. You know, there's going to be two different classes of UAVs here. There's going to be those that are like professional quality and such that are, are highly reliable and very successful in performing their mission and very uh, trustworthy and, and safe. Therefore, you can use them and you can assure yourself that they're going to perform the mission that you've bought them for and right. that you've certified them for. And there's going to be the other class, which is the con kind of like the low end of the consumer market, which is going to be based on uh, uh, free market economics more than it's going to be based on the certification safety issue, but more like in the toys and in the consumer level functions that won't actually find themselves in the main line of, uh, of drone services. So right. one that, that follows that concept of uh, systems engineering and one that follows more a concept of uh, exploration and and, and new systems. John, how do, we, uh, how, do we, how do we get the two sides to, how do we get the drone industry to talk to the industry that you represent and have initial conversations about how that, uh, uh, that, that particip uh, the par uh, <laughs> uh, separation of function and right. the individual operations of the components within can be, how that thinking can be transferred over to the, to the drone business. How would you propose we put that together? Well, it's certainly economies of scale. You know, inside software systems, going back to mainframes, and, and uh, as, as it became more expensive, as it was a more serious piece of banking software or financial management software, these concepts introduce themselves, actually, because uh, it's, what, it's what makes it uh, economically feasible. Uh, so as, as a drone is more expensive, let's put it that way, uh, I think you'll see more of it. Uh, you know, I think pushing it down to the smaller drones uh, will just be volume. I think, I think those things are going to, are going to happen. It, it's, uh, 
I mean, when you've got a hundred parts or a thousand parts and you, uh, you upgrade one part and you want to know what happens to the rest of the parts when you put it together, it's all systems engineering and testing and it's a, it's a, a philosophy of engineering. It's, it's a way of, uh, we call it SEMP, Systems Engineering Management Plan, uh, and it's a, it's a way of going forward. But it's usually done more in military systems or in systems that are critical uh, to, uh, so like air, airplanes, obviously. Uh, and uh, so, but also systems that, that cost a lot of money or systems where the companies that are building them are uh, careful about, uh, about quality. So uh, let's, let's yeah. take a look at how that applies in the specific case of a, a UAV supplier and then how that figures in the, in the world of the emerging state test sites in a moment sure. when we get back from our, our first break here, John. Okay, great. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. Back on folks, uh, downtown Honolulu here, Ted Ralston and uh, John Mullen in San Francisco on our show, Where the Road Leads. The final show being telecast out of the basement of the Pioneer Plaza building, as we mentioned earlier, Jay Fidel is giving us all a dramatic raise as we go up to the eighth floor uh, next week. We were talking once again about our favorite subject, uh, UAVs, drones, whatever you want to call them, John Mullen from the cyber side, and we were speaking on the need for the drone industry to embrace some of the emerging concepts in the software industry that allow success and reliability to generate systems that are uh, useful in the economic sense as opposed to in the toy or uh, model sense, where basically if we have, if we spend money on something in the commercial uh, sector, it has to work, it has to perform the mission, it has to uh, be uh, reliable and safe to that level. So the discussion we were having uh, during the break here was that there are, it came to my mind anyway, there are professional societies, if you will, or organizations that are dealing with the uh, drone business, and I'd like to hook John and his side of the coin into the organizations that are managing all the uh, industrial players and see if we can have this conversation with them as, uh, as a way to accelerate the success of uh, the emerging drone business. It's moving so fast. It's moving faster perhaps than the electronics business ever moved, John. And, it's moving uh, very fast. It's moving very fast. I think the focus of, that I've been looking at is more the data communications to them, how you remotely manage and, and fly them. Uh, and then how people could crack in and, and uh, attack that network and take over the drones, or how, as, as we've talked before, Ted, as, as you're trying to do surveillance over a crowd, you want to see uh, the, the drones may be forbidden for this uh, event, and you want to see has anybody got one, and, and where are they flying it from, uh, and, and all of those kinds of questions. And that is all monitoring the, uh, the RF radio frequency waves that, that connect to the drones. Uh, and so as we work very hard to secure them. We're also securing what we're calling the Internet of Things, uh, which is right now moving very, very quickly. Like, and, and actually, the drones are part of it. Uh, but what we're trying to do is get a uh, secure, uh, universal, reliable, robust infrastructure to allow data communications between all the wireless parts in such a way that you can protect uh, from attack, including drones. So I think, as you and I were talking about, the different uh, kind of modularity and uh, repli rep replicability of the uh, software process. You also have to put in there the uh, open standard 
secure interface to the communications. And I think that's, that's a key area, at least that I'm interested in. Uh, there's many parts of the drone world that are moving very quickly, the, the manufacture, the design, the size, the scope, the utility, the function. Um, but right now, uh, I seem to be focused a lot on the data communications and the control part of it. That, that, that is, to me, the, the really fascinating aspect. We, we could even include spectrum identification in there in terms of what spectrum is actually going to be made available to these systems to operate. Right now, they're operating in the 2.4 and the 5.8, typically, which are the unregulated uh, free space within the spectrum. And so all the cell phones are in there, all the Wi-Fi is in there, all the garage door openers are in there right alongside the drones. That's not going to work. So we, we really need to address the, uh, as, as the drones expand, we need to provide spectrum for them to operate in, in the RF domain. Otherwise, we're going to have the inability to communicate between the drone and the, and the, uh, and the pilot on the ground. In fact, yeah. that's the essential difference here between the aviation business and the drone business. The aviation business has the pilot in the cockpit making all decisions regardless of ground uh, radars and such and air traffic control systems. The decisions are made in the cockpit. There's no ground operation of that aircraft at all. And all the reporting systems and the sensors and all provide the information in the cockpit to let the crew make the right decisions. Here, we're putting that function on the ground but what we've introduced then is that communications channel between the drone and the ground station and between the ground station and all the sensors that the pilot would normally receive, which complicates by a factor of eight on a cube basis the, uh, the networks and such that are going to be in place to make this all happen. So once again, the security of the spectrum is going to be a factor here. And I, you know, I wonder if the Department of uh, Commerce and its NTIA has even faced up with that at this point in time. Well, I don't think so. But you know, there is a class of drones, and people don't usually think of them because I think they're almost almost universally in the military sector, where you don't even have any communications, where the drone's <laughs> pre-programmed to do a flight path. <laughs> and it still does come from the, from the plane, but there's no human in the plane. <laughs> well, we're going to actually see, I think, a lot of that in, in the world of what we're calling UAVs, or we've, we've we try to call them UAVs, we try to call them remotely piloted aircraft. We've kind of realize they're drones. Uh, that's such a simple word, and the universal journalism business has picked it up, so like it or not, that's the word. But I think what we're going to find in, in, the, uh, in the automation of the flight management is a lot of automation, but with the ability to do manual takeover, so that even though the bird is out doing a, a, a following waypoints and making decisions on its own, uh, based on the pre-established flight path, the operator on the ground still has the obligation to keep it in sight and to uh, recover it or get it out of the sky should there be an issue. And um, so flight termination uh, in that sense is an important part of this. So automation to make it successful at performance level, uh, flight termination and, and security to make it non, a non-safety issue. But once again, once again, the issue of uh, communication and, and spectrum operations and such become the connector between the ability to actually do what I just said and, uh, and the thought of it. So right. we, we come back to the, the point once again of a complex network uh, involvement here. And what you were describing, John, about the, uh, about the uh, wireless communication and the nodes and the, and the such and how they're going to relate to each other, even in the infrastructure business, is the same as it is for a drone. The drone is just, not, is just a moving piece of infrastructure. Right. So infrastructure faces the same problem that we face in the world of drones. Yep, and it's the highest topic. There's a, a brand new open source, uh, 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 let's see, uh, nonprofit organization, OIS, I think is the initials, trying to formulate a secure infrastructure for the Internet of Things and trying to be a repository of all different companies to, to come behind a, uh, an open standard here. And uh, you'll see more and more of these start to emerge because it is a... It, it, well, it, it reduces the cost for anything because if, if you go and you build a solution for the Internet of Things, in order to be uh, prudent and make sure that it's secure, you have to go through what they call an accreditation cycle after you build it, which is very expensive, and, and you have to prove that it's secure in all areas. But if you can, uh, if you can start with the infrastructure already going through a, a type accreditation, then uh, you're starting with a secure set of pluggable components that have already been interoperably tested. 
So now it reduces the cost for every deployment, every installation, and it makes it go faster and easier. It reduces the overall cost. It increases security and safety and, and uh, timeliness. So I, that has to be the direction we're going. So we need this secure, pluggable uh, infrastructure, and, and that's why there's so many people focused on it. That but term that you used twice now on this, this program, Internet of Things, I don't think we've used that term on this uh, uh, sequence of programs before. That's a really interesting term. It represents a, a growth of the Internet beyond uh, just a, a system of connectivity, and it actually makes it look like a, a network connector between objects or between elements that, that all perform together in some kind of a business construct. Yep. It's, it's uh, connecting uh, things on the Internet that, are, that aren't people, basically. Robots, uh, components, lights, cameras, uh, servo motors, uh, valves. Uh, UAVs, uh, drones. Yeah, UAVs, definitely. UAVs and, and uh, uh, flying UAVs, uh, uh, cars that, uh, that are driving themselves, uh, boats that are automatic, submarines, etc. cetera, uh, things, right? <laughs> that's, that's what it's about. And, and for the last 10 years, it's been projected, and it's, we're seeing the fastest growth on the Internet is things uh, as we become a more automated society. So things, so this is the Internet uh, actually... Once again, it, it goes beyond the connectivity part to a functional component where it actually does something as opposed right. to providing a basis that allows you to make a connection. This, this then has, again, the automation built in and the autonomy, and it performs a mission by right. connecting components and performing some mission. You hope it's in the right direction. You hope it parks your car correctly. You hope it flies your drone correctly. You hope it operates your dishwasher at home correctly when you're not at home. Well, I think... As most people who studied it a lot agree, it will be much, much safer, for example, the cars. Uh, the, the cars are going to be much, much safer than people driving them. <laughs> and you'll get there faster with less uh, disruption and uh, you know, every, everything will work a little better. When, when, you, uh, when you're making decisions at 10 thousandths of a second you're in the, in the devices are communicating with each other and they're not asleep and they're not drinking and they're not <laughs> reading books and eating hamburgers. <laughs> um, you know, things will go a little bit better. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's going to be a lot safer and a lot more reliable uh, as we go forward. And that would then apply to the entire uh, Internet of Things. That is, it's all going to get, by, by taking that administrative load and that standard operating load off the human mind and making it, again, standard, and generating standard connections between components and standard interface functionality, that has reliability and safety built in, that allows the Internet of Things to occur. And then right. the value then of the Internet shows up in that, in that value and quality of life aspect that we've spoken of. So we can get back to uh, uh, enjoying what we like about life and not worrying about the connections. That's the plan. Hopefully it works that way. <laughs> cool. And the same thing for drones, of course, as well. And getting back to a, uh, a really uh, immediate and practical level, in the last... Uh, well, we had AVUSI done in Atlanta, which was the uh, unmanned uh, air vehicle uh, international organization with all the systems that were, uh, that were down there, probably 9,000 people and probably 500 different uh, systems, both uh, air vehicles and some uh, underwater submersibles and some surface, surface vehicles of some kinds. And uh, it, was, it was just intriguing to see that, that expansive growth. But it brings to mind the Internet of Things functionality. How are all these things going to work together? Uh, they can't all just operate isolated. They have to be operated in conjunction with each other uh, for, for no other reason to avoid banging into each other. But That's then right. performing a mission requires some kind of coordination and formation. So uh, the, the systems are emerging faster than that network connectivity and uh, Internet of Things uh, safety and security is occurring. So we, again, we've said it for about the third time, we had to jam them together. But beyond that big picture, uh, we've had several events here just in Hawaii that are, were incredible in the last couple of weeks. We had the Makers Fair two weeks ago. There's a much bigger one up in Seattle and San Francisco. John, we've got the mini one here. But uh, drones and in various forms, surface as well as air, are becoming a main factor in this Makers Fair because it does become a internet, it becomes some of the objects that are going to be in this internet of, of, uh, of things. And uh, it's a great way to have um, exposure to the public and expressing uh, issues and get the socializing the systems, uh, taking on questions that might, uh, 
that, that we might not have thought of as a, uh, on the developing side, and, and pushing forward this concept of respect that I spoke of at the beginning of the, of the show. So we had the Makers Fair. We had a lot of attention. We had some uh, the fun aspects of drones. We had drag races and obstacle courses to deal with out on the baseball field. And we had the Boy Scout Makahiki on the same day, which is uh, the largest and the oldest gathering of Boy Scouts in the country. And uh, we had uh, drone displays there and simulations. The certain location we were in prevented flying, but we had simulations, and that was a really incredible uh, thing just to watch the kids uh, jump on the sim and, and play with that. And then um, we had something called Unconference here uh, two weeks ago or a week ago, which is uh, a sort of a ad hoc, uh, let's go solve problems gathering of people who like to do things like that. And uh, one of the incredible parts that came out of that collective uh, uh, activity was a discovery we made of some software available right here in Honolulu that does feature extraction from, and you mentioned 10,000 uh, frames per second a minute ago, it does feature extraction on a video at 10,000 frames per second. It immediately struck me as a system that could be uh, the starting seed corn for getting into some cockpit visualization when, the, when there's no pilot on board. If we can pull features out of a streaming video at 10,000 frames per second and scan across the 120 degree and the 40 degree up and down uh, field of view and extract out of there features that are not, not favorable to continued flight, such as buildings and, and trees and towers and other aircraft and UAVs and such. What a, what a, what a great aspect that would be to the uh, what's called the detect and avoid component that's necessary for, for uh, uh, drones to move ahead here. So. Right. If they can make decisions at 10,000th of a second. So not only see it and, and pull it out and figure out what it is, but change the flight course based upon that. You know, actually act on it quickly, robotic. So, so, so let's talk about those, those elements of the necessary technology to move forward here. We've got detect and avoid. We've got uh, uh, the, the certification we began dabbling with a little bit ago in the Internet of Things. And we'll talk about the next phase in UAVs, which is going to be beyond line of sight. And that's where the holy grail is in the economic success. But we'll talk about beyond line of sight, beyond the next commercial break here. So we're <laughs> back to our studio announcer, and we'll see you in a minute. To uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Wednesday. And we have Sharon Moriwaki, my co-host and co-chair of the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And we have War Warren Bollmeyer today, a special guest with the Hawaii Renewable Energy Alliance, and also a member of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. In fact, he's our Renewable Energy Working Group Chair. So he is. He takes care he is. of all of our... You ought to see him in song and dance, too. <laughs> <laughs> he does the musical part of the show. Uh, Sharon is more serious than that, but not much more not serious. Much more. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what do you think of this show? I mean, is this good? I think this is good. We hope it's good. We hope it attracts a lot more people than than our forum so that people can see what's going on in energy and green energy and uh, and and call in right in tweet yeah, we or want Twitter that we want uh, we want public engagement civic engagement from everybody because that's the only way we're going to get down the road on this right Warren yeah I think so and it's an opportunity for guys um, like me to share a little bit of their mana and and uh, sometimes get the facts right. Who was that guy that said, just give me the facts, you know, start with the facts and then work from there? Oh, it was Dragnet guy, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jack that was one. Yeah, yeah, I was just in grade school then. I barely that remember that. Yeah. Just the facts, man. Just a bad man. Here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, <laughs> every Wednesday from 4 to 5. You'll see. Come back soon. Right, Sharon? Great. Waterburn? Uh, yes. <laughs> Friday afternoon, folks, back live in downtown uh, for the very last segment of the very last show from this particular location of our Think Tech Studios, our show Where the Road Leads, leads to UAVs, leads to Internet of Things, leads to uh, automation within the infrastructure. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the future. We're just talking to John. Uh, uh, John. John Mullen. John Mullen, <laughs> sorry. When you get old, you get these senior moments, you know. And uh, anyway, John, uh, for some reason, your name just dropped out of my mind there. From a John Mullen in San Francisco, who is at Promia. He's the president of Promia, which is an organization that uh, Promia promotes. What does it promote? It promotes uh, not MIAs. It promotes uh, promotes uh, security in the in the cyber network and 
the, the necessary elements to grow the cyber network to do the Internet of Things job we all want it to do. But we were talking uh, uh, beyond line of sight uh, before the last break. Beyond line of sight means flying a UAV or a drone to uh, beyond the ability of the ground station or the observer to actually see what it's doing. Right now, the rules are stay within, beyond, within, the, current, within the line of sight so you can act as the onboard pilot would and avoid obstacles, avoid other aircraft primarily, and, and such like that. But to get beyond line of sight is really what's necessary to make the, the whole drone or UAV business uh, practical and economically useful. For example, if you're doing search and rescue, uh, or doing just construction site management, and you were flying on one side of a building, in order to fly the other side of the building, which is only 100 yards away, and scan that side of the building, you have to physically walk to the other side in order to keep the drone within line of sight. And uh, if we could just fly it from the one location and depend on the onboard sensors and depend on the ability of the ground system to analyze it and do the setbacks and such, uh, how much better off we'd be. So, yeah, okay, we, uh, our, our studio announcer tells us we've lost uh, John Mullen by the grace of cyber insecurity here. So we've been hit by our own uh, uh, petard here. Anyway, um, the issue is getting beyond line of sight, folks, and so uh, that requires a whole transition in thought from how we do drones and UAVs today, and they could, whether they're ground, uh, ground crawling systems or whether they're uh, flight systems, it's all the same. The person whom you're trying to reach or, is currently uh, unavailable. Or, we've got some cross chatter here, uh, or, w or whether they're uh, self-parking cars. The ability to see and detect and then detect and avoid is the sequence we have to go through uh, with, with such high rate that we can handle the kinds of things that happen at the rate they happen, and with such high reliability that we have the safety necessary to protect ourselves and our loved ones as, as uh, this sort of thing occurs. So what was intriguing is that the FAA, who we often think of as being a, a, a rear view mirror operation, is actually looking ahead in a big way and two weeks ago announced a program with CNN and with uh, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad and one of the small drone companies, and again the FAA, these four-part four, four part public-private partnership, doing some testing and looking at evaluations of beyond line of sight with the idea of going 200 miles out from your current location, 200 miles out uh, and returning and performing a mission along the way. And the mission being performed here is observation of the railroad tracks uh, as far as 200 miles ahead by a small drone or UAV flying over the r route of the tracks using the connectivity provided by the cell phone towers and the, ra and the railroad communication system to reliably reach out ahead and with uh, uh, magnetic sensors in the UAV fly very, very close to the tracks and determine their condition based on disturbances in the electronic signature indicating cracks or deviation or corrosion or even a, a, loose, uh, a loose track and then bring that information back. And uh, as, as John said the, uh, earlier in the show, the, the automation doesn't take a break. It doesn't stop for lunch. It just works. So you get a much higher productivity out of a system like that in terms of determining track health. Then you could speed it up. You could expand it out. And this then gives you a more reliable train service uh, at lower cost. And the benefit is then in the safety increase and in the lower cost, uh, better economic return on something like that. That's a, a great example of getting beyond line of sight and uh, a, a, a very safe way to approach it. We're dealing with operation over a railroad track. So were there a problem of some kind, uh, the, uh, the issue would be confined to the tracks and the near environment. What a, a great way to move forward. But it, what, what's more interesting is the fact that uh, our good friends at the FAA are doing this and welcoming more. So ideas that fit in this kind of dimension are the kind of things that the uh, FAA is asking for us in the public-private partnership domain to help them with. So actually, I don't want to go through uh, companies' own strategies and such here, but we're doing several activities right here in Hawaii that are heading in that same direction uh, to use uh, drones or UAVs to increase the understanding of the health of our infrastructure and reduce the cost of operation and reduce the consequences of 
the infrastructure coming down to us. So the, the electrical power grid tracking, uh, the, uh, the earthen dams and such we have in the, in the state, which are quite numerous, the uh, water uh, provision system we've got, uh, those are all subjects that are really interesting to the people behind them uh, in order to use them as test grounds for bringing UAVs into the game to observe the dam, to observe the uh, power grid system. And uh, the savings are incredible. And the benefit to all of us who are ratepayers or who are uh, taxpayers uh, is, is pretty, pretty powerful. In the case of, uh, say, a typical power grid, not necessarily those here, but to send a man up a pole to do an inspection requires the pole to be shut down and the grid that it's dealing with to be shut down, which means the power has to be rerouted around that area and then you gotta turn it back on again. So you got all this engineering design to shut the power off and then you got the time if it's out and, and, uh, and such to prevent exposure to the guy up the pole. If you can just approach the pole or the line structure with a, a UAV that's non-conductive, uh, and get the imagery, you get the information you need from that kind of a, a proximity, you don't need to shut the power down. So you have a savings right there and a reliability increase that is just associated with that simple operation. Uh, think of the, uh, of the long stretches of uh, electrical power distribution system we have up in the Ko'olaus, up in the mountains, and the difficulty of getting there. Think of the helicopters required to fly our people up there. Think of how that could be made better by the use of drones. The dams. Uh, the dams uh, in Hawaii are basically earthen dams. They're affected by the vegetation growing on them. They're affected by the height of the water behind them. They're affected by even such things as the gate conditions that uh, prevent uh, folks from coming in when they shouldn't come in. All that can be done expensively from a manned aircraft, or it can be done very inexpensively from a, a drone and if we can get, this, get the systems down simple enough that the two guys in a truck can do the work, the, the, same, the same two guys who would do the uh, physical inspection today, just give them this range of their extension of their range in order to collect their information over a wider range faster, uh, how much better we would do in terms of getting information in to manage our infrastructure. And uh, this uh, show is not about monologues, uh, yet there's been one going on here for the last 10 minutes. And uh, if cyber has actually killed our connection with John, then the monologue has, has uh, no choice but to continue. But that won't be for more than three more minutes, because we'll be at the end of our final segment here. So uh, I just wanted to uh, bring to the attention of our audience how fast things are moving in the, in the world of drones, how important it is to see their connection into the larger world of uh, cybersecurity, and uh, how the role we all have of trying to put those together so we can go from the model airplane and the, and the consumer level systems into systems that have the necessary reliability and, and performance to achieve the missions we want them to, to achieve. And I'll, one last comment uh, I'd like to make. the. Again, I've made the comment several times on this show that the FAA is moving so fast in terms of leniency and lightening up on the requirements and making, it, making the airspace more accessible so that testing can be done and evaluation can be done and we can take these ideas and discussions we have and turn them into real activities uh, to the extent that just yesterday uh, a, a great doctrine was released which allows the six test sites, of which Hawaii is one, Hawaii is in, con in combination with Alaska and Oregon and Iceland as a, one of the six FAA test sites. I think Texas, uh, Nebraska, or pardon me, Texas, uh, North Dakota, um, Nevada, uh, New York, and some other folks on the East Coast are the other sites, and they're generally multiple state sites as well. At this point, as of yesterday, the sites themselves can uh, self-certify uh, UAVs and a wide range of UAVs to operate and as long as they stay below 200 feet they're being gonna, gonna be granted access to all airspace in the state or the states uh, as long as it's below 200 feet and isn't in a restricted area or at an airport or something like that where there's a, a, a another, another consequence so opening up the airspace at 200 feet or below is very, very useful in the R&D domain. It isn't all that useful in the actual economic domain, but for the point of getting moving forward, generating student programs at the university, uh, doing testing and such, 
under 200 feet is fine. So uh, the, the, those of us who have been dealing with this for such a long time are almost in a state of shock at how fast the regulations are lightening up and how clever the FAA is getting about making, uh, making this, the airspace available to us. So I just can't wait for tomorrow because I'm sure there'll be one more thing on the table that makes, what makes life easier. So it's all good. Um, and, and Hawaii, uh, in conjunction with Alaska, is a state site. That's would be good for us. Uh, and if we do this right, and we should talk about business in Hawaii at some point in time on this show, but as we've spoken before, the drones tend to be small. They tend to be uh, easily shipped. And uh, shipping, therefore, is not a necessary ingredient in the economic equation. Having a large factory uh, like Boeing or something next door is not a major factor. And there's absolutely no reason that Hawaii uh, couldn't become a, a central location of design, fabrication, and testing uh, in the world of drones because we have, in this small collected area, we have all the environmental issues that anybody else has. We've got more extreme environment uh, in terms of uh, uh, sheer cliffs, strong winds, a marine environment, uh, rain and strong winds, and uh, the factors that are necessary to uh, push testing to the limits. So we got testing, we've got the, uh, the, the knowledge of the need for the mission by virtue of the infrastructure we support here, and we've got the isolation that makes these systems very critical to us. A great place to do testing and design and development, and uh, we're working with the university already and anticipating that, uh, that the activity will increase at the university level, and then uh, that'll reach to, uh, uh, to our business community uh, faster than we can ever possibly imagine. And with that, the monologue, folks, is over. And I'd like to thank you very much for, once again, tuning in. And, um, and I will, with this, close our, our final episode of uh, Where the Road Leads from this particular location. And we're all going to enjoy our rays that Jay Fidel is giving us and move up to the 8th floor, where we'll broadcast next Friday from the 8th floor here uh, at uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, have a nice weekend.